sure everybody's in the right room. Uh, this actually is the talk, Software Archaeology and the Code of Doom. Um, my name is Carrie Miller. I'm down from Seattle. Um, if you didn't already hear me, unfortunately, this is my first session of the conference. I've actually had to go into work for the last couple days. Um, and I'm really sorry, because OS Bridge is my favorite conference by far. Um, thanks to a hilarious iOS autocorrect, um, this, appeared, uh, this conference appeared on my internal PTO calendar as Ostrich 2015. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't know, I have to find an emu farm on the way back up to Seattle or something. Um, I'm a lead developer for Living Social, although sometimes I like to say that I'm a heavy metal uh, software developer because I'm actually a lead software development engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, I work on a team called um, Merchant Internal Shared Services, or MISS. Um, <laughs> uh, we sort of uh, are a floating team that sort of like go around and, and uh, help other teams and projects that need uh, senior or lead support. Um, people, you know, uh, we're a group of developers who kind of specialize in code quality, being able to get up to speed quickly <coughs> on projects, um, and do mentoring to help people improve their code. Um, I'm also on the internal culture committee. Um, so I kind of try to imagine that this is sort of uh, what people think I'm saying. <laughs> uh, we don't have a five-year plan yet for Living Social, but we're working oh. on it. <laughs> so that's who I am. Um, um, before I get started, can I get a show of hands? Yes. yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I'm here to talk today about uh, software, software archaeology. But I want to talk a little bit about sort of like the nature of software first. And software development um, has really undergone a series of identity crises over the years. We're a relatively young industry compared to almost every other discipline out there. Um, and at various times, we've, been, we've, we've called ourselves scientists. You know, we came out of math, so we're some sort of like mathematicians and scientists. Early computers were used for bomb trajectory calculations and trigonometry functions. Later on, we became engineers as uh, computers became more and more integral to calculating load-bearing uh, calculations on bridges, for example. And so we, we tended to come into the physical sciences. And it's really only in the last 10 or 15 years that we've started to approach ourselves as artisans. The open source movement has really been a uh, huge boon to that idea, software as craft or software as art, because open source has really opened the doors to anyone to get involved. Anyone has gotten involved. Um, how many people here have a CS degree or CS background? Yeah, it's about 50-50. And, most of, and that's, that's held pretty much true no matter what community I'm in, whether it's you know, Perl or Java or Ruby or PHP or Python, they are all pretty much the same. The only, the only community where that's not true is closure. <laughs> um, but essentially at the heart of it, right, like one of the reasons why people who don't, aren't coming to us out of a, a computer science background are so successful is that we are essentially knowledge workers, <clears throat> organizing and categorizing and, uh, knowledge. Um, and as such, our profession draws on these tools and techniques from a variety of disciplines, not just the sciences, but the humanities as well. Usually we, treat, we speak in terms of lessons and practices derived from these hard scientists, sciences, and, and our sort of methodology is grounded in computer science and mathematics. Um, but there are these other useful tools to be gleaned. So most of these tools are, and, and techniques are really uh, most applicable within the concept of legacy. Um, legacy code is a horrible term, um, and I would much prefer um, someone came up with something else, like code I have never looked at before, or <laughs> like it's just it's just not catchy, right? Um, but we look at legacy code, and we tend to have this, this impression, especially if you're coming to it for the first time, you see all the mistakes and you see all the flaws. But what you don't see is you don't see the context in which that code evolved. When we look at dinosaurs, dinosaurs seem like crazy science fiction beings, if you think about it, right? Armadillos the size of cars, you go back even further. Six inch long teeth, how did they close their teeth? How did they mother their young? How did they chew anything? Um, let alone, like, how did these monstrous animals like, actually like, grow and live? And we're still trying to figure out how they supported themselves physically just walking around on land. How did they metabolize things? But what we're not seeing is we're not understanding necessarily perhaps the context of the Cretaceous or the Jurassic periods, where plant life was different and the plankton things were different. So there were different levels of oxygen in the air versus carbon dioxide, which led to different kinds of metabolism working uh, more efficiently than others. So things like that also apply to code. We don't see the radical changes 
um, that apply to code to, to force it into an, an evolutionary place that it finally arrives at. Um, we don't see the pressures of perhaps a project manager deciding on a Tuesday that you've got to have this demo ready by Friday, come hell or high water. Um, and so, you know, shortcuts get taken, uh, mistakes get made. There isn't time to do well, uh, well factored, robust red green refactor cycles. And just as living creatures uh, sort of carry these traits and adaptations forward, code, if you have a bad idea five or six years ago, or just any kind of idea, it can live on forever, if, as long as it isn't bothering anybody. But the instant it's actually bothering somebody, then it becomes a, a pain point and it's something to refactor. It's exactly how evolution works. Within the context of legacy code, one of the, the best social sciences that we can mine for or use as a, as a metaphor for how we think about approaching it is archaeology. And so simply put, archaeology is really the study of human history through the recovery and analysis of the physical artifacts left behind by previous cultures. And it's through this recovery and study of things like pottery shards and jewelry and um, things that have lasted through the years that archaeologists are able to construct these rich tapestries of what life was like in a particular place in a particular time. And we can understand and make uh, extrapolate what we know about how humans live and how humans interact to make assumptions about how the society was organized. Working with legacy code, the truth is more, is more often than not that it's the research and the methodical inquiry into the code uh, that gives us that context. And it's the key to getting a handle on it, not simply just you know, refactoring the horrible bits out. One of my favorite books is uh, A Fire Upon the Deep. Um, mm. Oh, somebody's read it. <laughs> um, and in that, Victor Ver uh, uh, Werner Vinge uh, introduces this concept of a code archaeologist. Um, and uh, Coraline, you and I have talked about this uh, quite a bit. This idea of, uh, in, in those books, the code archaeologists are um, people who do this research into the abstractions upon abstractions upon VMs all the way down to like, you know, 20,000 years in the future, we're still running Linux. And there's patches for the, you know, the January 1st, 1970 timestamps problems. Um, and these code archaeologists are employed by this high-tech culture in order to propel further future development. We work in the sort of the same way. We work with artifacts of a culture, like, an, like a regular archaeologist. Um, and these artifacts are relevant, but not necessarily contemporary. And it's through the analysis of these artifacts that we create this narrative about the project, um, about who was working on it, and the culture that it existed in. It's through this analysis that we're able to assess the relative value of the little pieces of code that we find. Something from years ago might seem like a mistake, but maybe it's perfectly uh, poised and has been refined to that, that place by the pressures that the code exists within. So in practice, uh, actual practical in the field archaeology uh, consists of three primary activities, and surveillance, excavation, and analysis. Um, and these three things are all taking place within the context of an overarching hypothesis that the scientists have about the, the what the dig is or the culture. So they'll decide, like, oh, this is a Roman villa, so we're going to expect you know, there'd be this sort of structure and layout. And that gives them the ability to uh, make educated guesses as they go. When dealing with legacy code, our objective uh, might simply be to achieve a better understanding. Um, it might be to implement a feature. It might be to fix a critical bug. But through uh, applying some of these techniques and these ideas, uh, you can learn that context and understand what pressures the software exists under. So start off with surveillance. So surveillance is just the idea, of the, process, the initial process of what does the ground that we're looking at consist of? Is it, you know, what kind of dirt is here? What is the size of the potential dig site? Um, what does what we can see here above ground and below ground with, with sonar, what does that indicate to us about the position of potential artifacts, potential information that is laying under the ground? Within code, this talks about um, finding out the overall architecture of the system, implementation details of a particular class, um, what is the, the culture and the community that's around this piece of code? How does it exist and how does it communicate? Um, so I'm going to try some like almost live coding here. It's not a video. <laughs> this code belongs in a museum. <laughs> I 
been trying to find a way to work that into the talk. Thank you so much. <laughs> Come on, Carrie. That's the freshest bullshit. No code belongs in a museum. <laughs> um, so the first place that I usually start with um, uh, a project really is simply to look at its, um, wow, thank you, Mac. Um, just looking at it at, at the readme of the file. So this is the Caligator project. Um, anyone not familiar with Caligator? Okay, a few people. Caligator is an awesome open source project that's been put together by the Portland tech community to be um, an open calendaring system for uh, uh, technical events that are happening in the Portland area. Is that a fair, fair thing? Okay. Um, I love it. I think it's a great project. Um, but um, if I were to approach this as just any old project, um, the README is absolutely the best place to start. Now, all too often, I'll decide I'm a Rubyist, you know, so I'll find a gem because it has a cool name, and I think I know what it does because I read this line up here. <laughs> that tells me all I need to, but I can install it and use it. Or, you know, I, I read a blog post or I hear somebody you know, like talking about it in a lightning talk, um, and all too often I skip the README. But the README is going to tell, um, especially with a good project. Um, will tell me a lot of information. And if the README doesn't, that tells me quite a bit as well. Yeah. If it's just the default GitHub README, um, well, you know, maybe, maybe I want to move on. Or maybe, as a piece of open source contribution I could do, is write the README. <laughs> you know, that's a good way to start. Uh, I won't lie, I get a lot, of, a lot of cheap GitHub commits out of doing that. <laughs> um, other things that um, are really great to look for, um, and why I, one of the reasons why I picked the Caligator project is it has mailing lists. It has two mailing lists, one for just general problems with the software and one for people who are doing development work on it. Um, and so if I'm approaching it, really, again, I'm just trying to get this sort of high level sense. I'm not trying to really learn too much. I'm looking for what is the language that people use? How are, these pe how are the people working on the project uh, communicating with each other? Do they have a particular um, style? Are they Consensus driven. Does everybody kind of get a say and then we kind of like, you know, kind of get our way to, towards mediocre happiness? Um, is it more of an academic environment where there's rigorous debate and you have to prove points, um, which has a lot of value? It's just one particular time, kind of communication style. Do they prefer to use the mailing list, GitHub issues? Do they have a JIRA or a pivotal tracker somewhere? All those sorts of things tell me little tiny pieces of information um, that help me begin to put together a story of the context of this project. Um, they have a wiki, <laughs> um, and I believe they even have like a special install, of course I'm not on the internet, um, a special install doc, which tells me there's a whole bunch of thought has gone into how we organize this project and how we're going to make it more open for people. Um, I, I look for a doc directory, um, and I take a look at this top level, and there's all of these .md files, so somebody's been doing a lot of documentation work. And you combine that with the wiki, and there's a lot of information here that I could, I could glean. Um, I also like to go through the issues. Oh, you can go see my notes. It's okay. <laughs> um, I, I go through the, the issues quite a bit and sort of look at, like, what are the problems that this community is facing? What are some of the things that um, mm -hmm. the software is dealing with? And you can, you can look at the, the language and the verbiage and the feature set that's being built most recently to sort of see, like, well, I know, what, I know what I want to see in a calendaring system, right? And so if the last 20 commits have been um, <coughs> related to maybe a JavaScript bug, well, maybe it's probably pretty feature rich already. But if it's, you know, initial commit, <laughs> which is my favorite commit of all to make, <laughs> um, or it's related to basic functionality that I think is integral to a shipped product, that tells me that maybe this isn't necessarily a mature product that I want to be using. Um, I can also look at the language that they're using in their commit messages um, to sort of get a feel, again, the flavor of that community. And I'll go in and I'll look at the comments that people are leaving on pull requests or issues to sort of see, again, what is the tenor of this? Is, it, is there a concern more the people in the project, the end user? Is it more about the technology? And I'm not putting any value judgments on those things, but that's going to change the way that I interact with the people that I'm going to be working with and also how I interact with the code. A project that is really sort of more about like the actual technology of it, say um, the concurrent Ruby project, really is much more interested in like the science of making you know a usable Ruby concurrency library. Um, we're not going to worry about like necessarily about 
the usability of something. I'm going to be more concerned about the, the, the computer science correctness of a thing. Uh, whereas if I'm doing something that's more aimed at children and is very focused on this being a project for children, well, maybe then I'm going to be really concerned about making sure like variable names are, are well, well done and you know, the API is intelligent or relatable for a child. The actual code itself, um, there's two commands that I use an awful lot. Um, well, I won't say an awful lot. Um, rake stat. Um, New, this is, what is that about? Oh, it's stats, that's why. <laughs> JK. <laughs> when I was practicing this talk, I made that mistake every single time. <laughs> Practice makes less imperfect. Okay, so rig stats really does sort of like just a gener generic line counting. Um, and there's not necessarily a ton of information you can get here, but it's kind of a nice little introduction to this. Uh, um, to, to a Rails application. Uh, and I apologize, I am a Ruby developer for the most part, uh, with a little sprinkling of Elixir on the side, so uh, you'll have to forgive me for that. Um, almost all languages and frameworks have tools that are very similar to this, though. Um, so from this, this is just a simple line counting. Um, we see lines and lines of code, so lines of code takes out white space and comments. Um, and this tells me, like, there's not a lot of JavaScript here. Um, even if it's all minified, there's still 52 lines of JavaScript. Even I can handle that. Um, the code to test ratio down at the bottom right corner, 1 to 1.6, this is probably a well-tested application. And looking at like the sheer amount number of lines of test versus lines of code down there to the left, um, that gives me a lot of confidence that if I installed it correctly and I ran rake and it worked magically, uh, if I ran the tests and they're all green, then I can probably trust the software. Um, if those numbers were inverted, if uh, we said we had around 4,500 lines of code and 3,000 lines of test, I might be a little less cautious I'm, or a, a little less brave to dive in and simply start making changes and be able to trust that the, the uh, safety net of the test suite is going to catch me. Um, Rake Notes, in this case Rake App Notes, is a really awesome little tool that I'm surprised that more people don't know about. Ooh, it just got me today. Now you know about it. Uh, what it does is it basically scans your entire Rails application and looks for comments that start with capital, uh, in all caps, to do, fix me, and optimize. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you're getting something out of value here. Um, this is, I love this because how often do we leave like, you know, to do or fix me's or WTF's in the code, right? And then like we never go back to them. We never go back to them. Um, so, you know, if I have an hour or two to kill or I'm really bored, this is kind of like a, not a bad way for me when I, to, to approach an application because I can kind of go in and like, what are the things that people are concerned about? Um, in my day-to-day -day refactoring work, again, if I have that hour or two and I want something to kind of like chew on, I'll go find a to-do or an optimize and just sort of like ponder it. And then it becomes kind of like a little code kata for me. Um, another cool thing with uh, Rake Notes is you can actually give it a custom flag. Um, and I, I don't think there are any custom ones uh, in Caligator, I apologize. But you could say Rake, Rake Notes, uh, custom equal WTF or Rails 4 upgrade or something like that. And I actually just went through a Rails upgrade project where we did that. We left notes to ourselves of things that we of shins and hacks that we needed to pull out after we were finished with the upgrade project this way. Uh, we left it in the code itself, um, especially so that people coming along behind us, if they came across a little shim or a crazy little hack, they would know, like, okay, that was that project that ended two years ago. I can safely remove this now. Um, a lot of people also get um, a lot of value out of code metrics, and I am one of them. Um, the two more common ones that we have uh, in the Ruby community are flog and flay. Um, flog is a, uh, generates an opinionated uh, complexity number for code. Um, it works best when you give it arguments. There we go. Um, the formatting is off because of, obviously, the uh, large font size. Um, but it calculates the um, number of assignments, the number of branches, and the cyclometric complexity of the code to come up with a number. So it's cyclometric complexity. Are people familiar with cyclometric complexity? 
Okay, cyclomagnetic complexity is basically a number, a whole number, which represents the number of states that the code can exist in. Oh. Yep. So if you have an, an if else, the code can be in two different, that code can be executed in two different states, right? There is something that is switching its state. Um, so it has a cyclometric complexity score of two. Um, thereby, you should have two tests for that piece of code. Um, FLOG is designed to try to quantitate um, the amount of pain that you're going to feel if you try to change this code. <laughs> so it does all the sorts of numbers, like how many, how many variables are we using, how many branches do we have. Um, and it also um, assigns like random score values for things like metaprogramming or like really crazy enumerable hacks. Um, anytime you're doing something outside the norm, if you're doing a lot of law of meter violations, that score racks up even faster. It has like a, a bonus multiplier, basically, <laughs> like applied. Um, a good, if you're working in the, in the Rails world, um, from a typical data model, like a method should have about a complexity of 10. Uh, for controllers, it's about a 20. Uh, so we see like the total complexity for this application is uh, thir about 3,100. And we've got 8.7 uh, as an average. That's a really good average. Of course, that's an average. <laughs> we see here there's a number here that are pretty high. I apologize for the highlighted color. Um, 95.9, that's a lot of complexity. Um, the most complex I've ever seen is around 13,000. Um, yeah. Sorry, is that for a method or a file? Or? Oh, that was, that was for a single file. Okay. And, and the highest method I've seen is around 800. So that, that top one there, is that also a file? Is this for file? Um, yeah, what we're seeing here is these are the class names. Thank you. And then after the pound is the actual method name itself. Uh, in this case, the none. Uh, refers to uh, code that is existing outside of a method. Um, so in this case, active, this is an active record model, I know. So it's doing like database setup and defining um, query scopes and things like that. There's a lot of complexity in there that's getting dinged for. Lots of lambdas. Um, <laughs> flog uh, dings you for lambdas. Um, another really awesome tool that um, I like to use is called Flay. Um, Flay is... Um, analyzes the um, abstract syntax tree to look for duplication of code. Uh, are there sections of code that are basically executing the exact same tree when you boil it down into the BC? Um, it's code duplication, things that you could actually end up drying up. Um, it's super awesome, and it's super useful for finding those refactoring targets, but it also tells me how well factored is this code. This code is actually pretty, pretty good. Um, in views, you often see uh, duplication. Um, this is probably down here, probably something I could factor out because it's in the same file and these line numbers here, 70 and 75, it's physically close together in that code. So it's probably something I could end up refactoring out into like a convenience method or something. Um, Flog and Flay are really, really great. Um, they're examples of static analysis tools as opposed to dynamic tools. Static tools like this, they merely analyze your code. They're, they're co very complicated and fancy regular expressions. Uh, dynamic analysis actually watches your code as it runs to generate some sort of characterization for it. Uh, that would be like a, a code coverage tool or a performance metric. Uh, any questions about, th about what I'm talking about so far or, or feedback or complaints? Jonan. The cyclometric complexity number, if I have an if else, I thought I have two states, right? If I have variables in there, it increases the potential number of states because the variables can change. Is that? Yeah. So that will increase the cyclometric complexity. And then there's one type of cyclometric complexity that is ABC. Yeah, that's assignment branch of conditions. Okay. And that's what FLOG does. Okay, all right. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so these numbers are, are, are interesting to me, but what I like to do is I like to, to start to graph them against each other, um, which will give me a, a broader base of, of what's the context of these numbers. Um, one tool that I, a little gem I wrote. Uh, I get, <laughs> sorry, I hate it when people like, like promote their own product in their, in their talks, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, what's that? <laughs> what's that? Oh, it's really good. Okay. It's really good. <laughs> Lots of typos, though. Yeah. Um, it's called Turbulence. And what it does is it, it calculates the, the complexity value of every file. And then it graphs that against the churn rate, the number of times this file has been changed in the version control. Uh, it supports Git, Perforce, SVN. <clears throat> so I think that's pretty much I, I'd love to add Mercurial if someone wants to do that. Um, 
And what's really, uh, this sort of helps us to identify problem pieces of code. Because a piece of code could be complex, but it just has to be complex. And if it never changes, does it matter? Because complexity is what impacts you. How difficult is it to make a change? And if you're never changing the file, then who cares? But if you have a very complex file that you're always changing, that's where your bugs are going to be coming in. Because you're, you're constantly going to have to be relearning it and going through that pain. So those are your pain points. Uh, this is the churn versus complexity uh, turbulence chart for Caligator. This is pretty good. Um, complexity is top to bottom. Churn is left to right. So we have a very complex file here, um, the event model. I don't know if you can read that or not. It's been changed or touched 16 times in Git. That's not too bad. The ones that are changing all the time out here has almost no complexity at all, even though it's been touched 177 times. So this is an example of actually a really good, a fairly good project. Um, I might want to refactor this application helper. This, this seems like a target, possibly, because it's up and to the right. It's up in this uh, quadrant that we really wanted to fix things. Um, Turbulence also is able to produce a tree map version of it, and this makes it even, even starker. The relative size, each, uh, each file in our project has a square or a rectangle. Uh, each rectangle's size is its churn amount, and its color, green to red, I apologize to anyone who's colorblind, um, is, uh, its color is its complexity. You can see our complexity is nested down here in these tiny little files that don't change all that often, and our big targets, the things we're touching all the time, they're, they seem pretty good. To show you an example of a project that doesn't really have such a great uh, example of this, um, here's this one. Um, I believe this is the one for the Canvas LMS, uh, the open source version. Um, you can see here, uh, it's a learning management system uh, for uh, teachers and students to like, basically have an online uh, learning management system. Sorry, I don't have the spiel down. This is almost off the chart here. Um, this is the data model for courses. Its churn is uh, almost 10,000 times in the database, a very high complexity. But course and user, those seem like core concepts to this thing. So of course people are touching it all the time, right? There's always changes. But what this tells me is possibly that, uh, especially given the distance between these two, right, that uh, um, maybe the, the project up to this point, um, people haven't really uh, engaged in any sort of refactoring process on these models. Perhaps they haven't looked at that model and sort of like tried to, to find out what can we factor out of it into other classes? What sort of hidden objects are existing within this, uh, this application? And the tree map uh, kind of really tells a story. We've got six, six of the largest seven um, have some bad complexity ratings. And everything else is great, you know? Everything else is fine. Um, so these, these would be the, the targets um, for a refactoring effort. Um, anyone have any questions or comments? What questions do you have right now? I have a comment. The previous chart that you showed has little dots and triangles at the bottom. One of the things that I found very useful working on Canvas is being able to turn them off and on. You can click on app models, and it will remove all the models. Yep. Oh, JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> You may be going into this later about some of the resources when you were developing this for when you were figuring out what to do, what research you looked at to show that these are, you know, useful kinds of metrics. Yeah, um, so I basically just started reading um, everything I could get my hands on about code metrics. Um, I started like using flog and flag just kind of in my day-to-day -day development process um, to, to try to find these like refactoring because I do a lot of refactoring. And um, just reading through um, the Wikipedia for complexity and you know, the abstract syntax tree metrics um, gave me a lot of things. So uh, McCabe is, uh, I can't remember the person's first name, <clears throat> but uh, last name is McCabe, uh, wrote a lot of, of this. Uh, Microsoft and uh, IBM have done a ton of research about this. And if you look in like, um, is it IEFT, IEF? The Internet Engineering Task Force? Yes. The yeah, the, 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 no, IEEE. Oh, IEEE. IEEE has a lot on this for some reason. Thank you. I was like, I know it's not the task force. Uh, I was, the compendium that I read that was very helpful on some of these topics was making software, colon, 
What Really Works and Why We Believe It, from O'Reilly, edited by Andy Oram and Greg Wilson, which is a set of lib reviews and studies on a number of topics, including metrics. Awesome. That sounds so good. I want to get that. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and there's, there's, there's jillions of different metrics. Um, and I'll show some of them uh, if I have time later. But can you tweet that at yes, me? Yes, we'll Thank you. OK. I want to remember that. Moving on. Oh, so we had dinosaurs, and we had that, and we had, oh, we're in the wrong, uh, that would help. Nope, that's going to help. OK, so excavation. Um, excavation is what you think it is, right? It's the digging down into the actual details. And we're trying to identify where particular features are implemented so we can begin to uncover physical artifacts relevant to the feature, the actual code itself. We've looked at it, and we, we can see that the code in question is located in certain positions, and we have a, a hint of its context and how it's incorporated into the larger system. And now we have to actually dig to understand the code's provenance, its place in the logical architecture of things. Um, this involves determining the relationship between different code fragments and nearby objects and methods, the callers and senders that are, who's accessing this code, who's relying on it, who is, has what code is there that's vestigial, that isn't used anymore, like a, a monkey tail. Physical archaeologists also spend a great deal of time and attention determining the age of artifacts um, through a variety of techniques, because placing a particular object um, accurately in time is essential for understanding the context it was used and how it was created. So we're, all, we're also interested in this idea of how old is a piece of code. Not because older code is good or bad, but simply that older code tends to be code that nobody has paid attention to. If code hasn't been touched in several years, there's not just probably one cycle, but maybe two or three cycles of people coming into the company and changing their understanding of the code and of the business itself. So one idea of, ref of uh, <coughs> changing our perspective on legacy code is thinking of it as code that has not been the focus of attention for us. OK. So those are some of the tools that dig into that. Pay no attention to my Legos. Um, I showed earlier like the rake notes idea. And when I was going through this project and looking for things, I, I, I looked at the Fix Me, and this one really caught my eye um, because it's a novel, right? I mean, this, this, it's an essay length comment about what's going on in this code, and I really wanted to see what's going on with it. Um, is this font and coloring okay for people? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> going down, this isn't a really long file. Um, and if you're not, not involved in Rails, this is a, a view template that's going to be displayed uh, with some embedded Ruby. Um, so the comment is pre you know, that Gal has uh, disabled the reimport UI because people are doing this, and it's horrible and overwhelmed. So I'm seeing a lot of like, language around feelings and you know, the, state of, the state of mind of uh, frustration at this thing working or not working. So if false, <laughs> which is my favorite way to do a feature flag. The best, the best key is the delete key, but you know, if false works as well. Um, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna show this uh, input checkbox, I guess, uh, on, the, uh, on this form for creating a new session. Um, well, that's interesting. I wonder how long this has been here. Thank you, autocomplete. Um, now, this makes me a little bit suspicious to see only three uh, commits here. So um, git log, um, and actually, I'm going to show you real quick. I have this quick, um, this is an alias that I use to minify and prettify the git log so I can actually read it. Um, so I'll be using that. Um, by default, Git does a really, really bad job of deciding what you get to see and what you don't. So Git has this flag called full history. 
um, which will show you, uh, it decides, like, I'm not going to show you certain things about this file. So in this case, like, it hid this branch because it thought, well, the changes that are in this merge branch are already contained in other commits, so it's not really important to you. Well, thanks, Git. <laughs> um, also, you know, this, I'm not sure this file um, was really created in February, uh, especially because this final commit here, or the first commit, is move sources controller under Calligator namespace. And moving files around in Git is kind of like, you sometimes can blow up and lose all your history. And git log does a really bad job of doing that. So you can actually add this fun command. Um, if you do follow. Sorry, can you show that again? <laughs> yep. Dash dash follow. You add that onto your git log command. And it will, uh, if the file has been moved, Git still knows that it was moved, but it thinks, yeah, whatever, you don't really need to see that. You're focused on this file as it exists now. Follow, it goes in and actually looks at that. What were the commits associated with the file when it was in that other place? Because Git doesn't really understand that the file is this thing that we picked up and moved to the computer. It's a thing that we deleted and copied over here, and there's this tenuous connection between the two. Um, so this file goes way back, and I can see like, yeah, that last thing I saw was in 2015, but then it's 2014, 2013, 2011, 2009. Um, so this is kind of an old file. 2008 was when it first came into being. Um, and if I actually look at that, uh, that one commit, I, I just happen to notice it here, where we're disabling the import UI. It's right here. Um, and it, that was disabled in 2009. So if I actually just look at that commit, because maybe something interesting happened there, um, git show and you give it a SHA, it'll show you the diff of that particular thing. Um, so yeah, that's all that commit did. So for six and a half years, because this was in January 2009, um, Calligator has not ha shown you the ability to check this re-import box. So this is probably code that nobody really cares about anymore. Um, so if anybody wants a cheap commit, you can delete this. Um, <laughs> or I would argue you could delete this. But I bet there's code in some controller somewhere that handles re-importing, right? That has to like, well, if this param is set, do this other little bit of work, which is adding to the complexity and the overhead of people's understanding of that controller. Um, so just by like a little simple digging, we found a way to improve this just by looking at the git log history um, of this file and understanding its context. Cool. Um, so I already showed you uh, some of the other stuff, so I'm just going to move on here. Uh, what questions do you have right now that I could answer? Or not answer? My questions are for you, because I'm more of a Python person, and so I'm going to be like, all right, I need to lay like, time to, to look I'm actually absolutely jealous because there's some great Python tools, um, and I'll give you, a, I'll give everybody a book recommendation um, for Python. Um, uh, your code as crime scene. Um, yes, your your code as a crime scene. It, it's I believe it's from Prags, and it's uh, it's metaphor is not archaeology, but uh, you know. Is this a book? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> not like. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, um, it's, it sort of it takes a CSI approach, but it talks about a number of tools uh, written in Python for Python. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have any options for natively PHP code bases? I can't, I, I, I did uh, PHP for a number of years, and I'm actually speaking at PHP World this year, so I'm, I will ask, because I'm, I'm actually really curious, too. Um, I don't know of any offhand, though. So getting into analysis, we kind of started to do analysis, but one of the key things of scientific analysis is to not just catalog what came in from the field, which is what we've kind of been doing so far, but to actually sort of like begin to tell that story, to take the facts that uh, field workers have dug up 
or the, the, the people who are working in the field have dug up um, and put it within this, the, what, what was the hypothesis the, the archaeologists have about this particular culture? What do we think we know about this code, this code base, or the team that's developing it? And how do we, uh, how do the facts fit that? Um, and is our hypothesis wrong? If we think the team is really, really bad, but, um, or uh, inefficient maybe, or less skilled, but the code is actually really, really good, that tells us a lot. Like maybe our interpretation of who, and who they are and what they can do, maybe that's off. So I'm gonna try, and, and I just got a few more minutes to show you um, a couple other tools. Um, code coverage is one that we talk a lot, a lot about in uh, analysis, and the code coverage for Caligator is absolutely awesome. The only things that aren't, that have kind of bad coverage, or, or less than 100% coverage, um, you know, are some files in this vendor gem, it's just a library, so who knows if that's even part of the project. Um, another tool that I've been using a lot is called um, <laughs> Code History Miner. And it's written in Java. It's OK. It's written in Java. Um, but just like Turbulence, it, um, it's trying to uh, chart different, different qualities of things that we can mine out of the Git log to, against uh, different metrics over time. Uh, for example, here's the code churn for this project. Uh, I apologize, it does not fit on the screen. But you can see that over time, this project has been active. But most recently, in the last year, it's become active again. That'll, that'll tell me that perhaps if I was going through and looking at the names of the top contributors, I want to look at people who have contributed lately. They might be different from people who contributed five years ago. Um, the amount of committers, how many average number of people per month, uh, unique people, have commits. Early on in this project, it was four, two, one, and recently Caligator has had a large uptick in the number of committers. So this community is opening up and bringing in um, new people to work on their code. And that's really exciting. This is, a very, this is probably a vibrant project that I would be welcome in because they're welcoming to newcomers. Uh, amount of commits by committer, you know, just kind of shows uh, who's working it and who's not. Um, let's see, uh, Reed, you're doing great. Doing a lot of stuff. Micah. Um, Eigel did a lot of work on this project um, before passing away. Um, so, you know, he does a lot of the early stuff. The number of to dos, wow. it's around 400. <laughs> Boom. Um, this is actually probably uh, has to do with, uh, they did probably did like a Rails upgrade or some sort of library upgrade that removed a large number of to dos. Um, but you can see, yeah, um, even for years it was still hovering, you know, 75 to 100, and now it's down to like four or five. That's pretty good. The number of files and commits, how much, not just like, are things changing a lot? Are there a lot of commits? But are these commits large, right? Um, are people doing these broad, sweeping changes all the time? Like, you know, oh, no, I'm going to use SAS instead of less, or I'm going to do a new JavaScript framework. I mean, it's Tuesday. <laughs> um, I love this one, the, the, the size of the, the uh, number of recently changed files out of the total number of files. So sort I'll of give you that, again, that context. Because sometimes it's not just enough to say, oh, 400 files changed. But if you've got 400 million files in that project, 400 is nothing. So this sort of just gives you a visual interpretation of that. Um, going by uh, file types, um, files that change together often. Uh, it's usually going to be like helpers or tests. Uh, here's one, the sources controller test and the sources controller. They're changing a lot together. That's really good. Folks are changing their tests to reflect new code. That's awesome. Um, more tree maps, punch cards. Now we're just getting into silly, fun stuff. The number of uh, word messages chart, how often do certain words show up in frequency, and of course, a word cloud. You know, we're getting down to the fun part. Yeah, real quick. Code, my, code history miner. And this will all be in the notes, right? Yep. Is that something that works with Git, or what's, what's it looking at? Um, it looks at Git and SVN right now. Okay. Um, and I believe that they, uh, I believe that they have support for CVS going way back. So um, I'm kind of over time, but I want to kind of finish up um, with uh, talking about something called Kenefin. Are people familiar with Kenefin? Can you spell it? Uh, C Y N E F E N. It's the horse trifle library. Yes, okay. yes. Um, no, Kenefin is a is a way of uh, of categorizing um, a complex system, and it was come up by the, the Welsh uh, scientist 
Daniel Snowden, not Edward, Daniel. <coughs> um, there are four different uh, kinds of systems. There are chaotic systems uh, where everything is new. We're constantly in crisis mode. We, can, we, we can't make hypotheses because everything is changing all the time. Toddlers running around with knives. <laughs> As we apply uh, understanding to it, we begin to develop in the, into complex systems where things are constantly in flux and we see rich emergent behaviors coming. We can make, we have a hypothesis, we can act upon it and see what happens. Things are not always repeatable though, and there's a certain amount of artistry that goes, These are, this is a high human touch environment. Uh, think of this like Iron Chef or a potluck dinner. You're never gonna, re <coughs> you're never gonna have the same thing every single time, but you can usually come out with a pretty good, pretty good thing then. Um, understanding of complex systems leads them to become uh, uh, complicated systems. Um, I like to think of this as like poker, where there's rules and cards and probability, but I can make observations. This is the domain of experts. Unfortunately, this leads to um, novelty and creativity sometimes getting shunned, uh, and a certain amount of uh, disagreement sometimes, because we're all, we're all experts, and you have to be an expert to work on a complicated system. Um, Complicated systems tend towards standardization, and if they get far enough down, they'll become um, obvious systems. Uh, this is the realm of perfect information. This is checkers or the game of war, where you, they're idempotent. You can do the same thing over and over again. When the system's in a certain state, it will always be in that state, and you'll always get the same results. McDonald's, right? <laughs> Humans are not really involved. We're involved only so much that they can't teach a robot to flip, flip the fries and burgers. Um, Obvious systems are kind of this, this holy grail that we kind of strive to because like, we want things to be easy and obvious. Unfortunately, obvious systems are brittle. So when obvious systems break, they fall back into chaos because we don't have a policy for that. You know, we're simply outside of our boundaries then. And you'll notice, um, if, you're, if you're thoughtful about this, that software can exist in all of these different states. A single, a single uh, repository will have bits of code that are like this. And software archaeology, is striving to understand which one of those buckets a piece of code is in at that given time by looking at the people who are working on it, the content of the code itself, how does it exist? Um, is it something that needed to be standardized? Is it a configuration file that changes all the time, but it's obvious and we're just, you know, we're bit flipping all the time? Or is it more chaotic and complex where we're working on a domain concept that we're not necessarily familiar with or is changing all the time because of demands? Uh, we saw in Canvas that the course and user objects were changing all the time. That's probably, maybe that's just because that's the core of the business. That's the thing that's getting touched all the time because business is putting new demands on that piece of software. So it's changing all the time. Ultimately though, it, because people. It's human nature to want to be the hero of our story. We, we exist as like sentience trapped in this shell. And we tend to think that everything that happens to us is about us, that we're the star of the story all the time. We want to be heroes. We tend to think of ourselves as the Indiana Jones who's you know, swooping in to fix the problem. Um, even when we're working on a team, we're still an individual and we're the star of our own stories. Um, but it's important to understand that it's not just evading the rolling boulder when working with legacy code. The truth is often that it's the research and the methodical inquiry into the context of the code that will yield results. How many people here have written bad code? How many people have written bad code on purpose? <laughs> okay, so some Perl developers. No! Right. <laughs> gotcha. Cheap, cheap thought shot, but accurate. <laughs> uh, what is it, the, the right ones understand, understand better? Um, right on the language? Yes, but thank you, that's fine. Writing bad code on purpose. Right. I'm sorry? Spiking is writing bad code on purpose because you yes. write code and you want to understand the problem and then you should, should, should throw it away and write tests with your new understanding and it's so hard to throw it away. It's so hard to throw code away. Um, when I'm spiking on things, I will give things dumb names that I could never put into production to like things that, you know, are like, you know, childish or whatever. I name them things after ponies, um, you know, like. Pinkie Pie user and Rainbow Dash model um, because I don't want to commit it and it helps me to throw it away. Um, but when we see the code that's convoluted and confused, um, it really helps to understand that we are human and it's created by humans as well. And all code, just like humans, has this potential to be excellent and amazing, right? We, we contain the entire, within us, we contain the entire spectrum of human experience. You know, there's nothing that we can't aspire to. Um, 
both good and bad. Uh, code is basically the same way. It's an expression of, of human desire because a piece of code was written to fulfill a desire that a person had, a problem that someone was trying to solve. And so understanding the, co the context in which that code was written, what did people want? How did they feel? Were they just having a bad day? Maybe someone's uh, parent passed away and they were trying to write code and that's why the tests are really bad. Understanding those sorts of human demands that the code has evolved into will really help you along the way here. So that's my talk. Thank you so much for coming.